Well, Jeremy Miner, thank yeah. you for joining us on the Both Sides podcast here in Australia at the Gold Coast. We've also got Hannon, who's replaced Kevin today. What happened with Kevin, man? Mate, Kevin, you couldn't make it, unfortunately. What? What? You get sick? What yeah, happened? So Kevin had some, some personal things that... Ah, uh, well, yeah, okay, some... get that guy better. Thanks for having me on the yeah, show. So it's, we really uh, appreciate your time. Yeah, I like the views here, man. I'm, I'm thinking about... Yeah, I'm going to get a place here in Gold Coast. It's nice. Best of the best. <laughs> so, Matt, the, the first place I'd like to start, because a lot of our industry have already heard of you, seen your reels pop up, because you mm. are quite popular in the sales dynamic space. Sure, yeah. The first place I want to start, though, is I'd love to get an understanding of what developed your framework your mindset to be able to be so in tune with how people think feel and the psychology mm. like what mm. must have happened to you growing up to have that mm. innate ability well i didn't get bit by a spider and became spider-man or anything like that so i went to school so i was educated so my degree was in behavioral science human wow. psychologist said and become a psychiatrist so uh you have to learn how the patient's mind works and how to you know take them out of current way of thinking into like a new way of thinking so they can heal themselves so it's very easy for me to take that when i got into sales while i was in college when i got into sales to take that same concept and apply it to sales and persuasion i'm surprised nobody else well maybe there are a few people out there but nobody else really figured that out <laughs> Yeah, definitely. That's so where it started for me. So first started studying on the pathway and obviously at the beginning you started door to door. Did mm -hmm. starting door to door all the way to CEO along mm -hmm. that journey, have mm -hmm. you picked up anything along the way that's really given you those tools or do you think a lot of mm -hmm. it's come through studying? Books well, it, that's where the foundation was. At. I mean, it's not like you're when you're in university, they're like, oh, you know, make sure when you call the prospect that you you say it more of kind of like a confused tone and then angle it into more of a curious tone. Like they don't teach you that type of stuff, but just theory, right? Mm -hmm. So they teach you theory, and when I went into sales, I started applying that theory and obviously crafting that theory. It wasn't like I mastered sales, still haven't mastered sales. So it wasn't like I mastered sales even in my first career, because I was in door-to-door -door for about five years while I was going to university and a little bit after, and then I got into enterprise uh, B2B sales doing debt relief services, and I'm talking to like you know huge companies, okay? Then I got into network marketing. That was the third industry I sold in, completely different industry, more back business to consumer. And then my last industry, I was selling like high-end investment uh, conferences to more investors and some family offices and other things like that. And so selling B2B and B2C. So uh, it's been an ever learning process. I had an 18 year sales career before I retired and then about a year later started seventh level. So that was started seventh level sometime in 2018, I think. 2018. 2018, yeah. Nobody knew probably who we were to probably at least middle of 2020. I think the first two years was me and my assistant. That's about it. Yeah. And now look at you guys. We have a couple hundred people now, employees. Well, talking off air about yeah. seventh level, do yeah. you mind explaining a bit about the actual concept of the number seven? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, so it's, it's just symbolic. So the number seven in a lot of different uh, ancient religions is just a number that can, it's considered a, a perfection number. I don't know why. I don't know a lot about that. Uh, but my minor in uh, university was world religions and I specifically studied uh, like ancient Christianity between the time of like uh, Christ apostles to the time of about I know I'm going to weird out here Council of Nicaea is like 325 AD where the Catholic Church basically was formed into like one universal church like all these Christian fragments fragments all have different beliefs Ethiopian Christians believe something compared to the Macedonians compared to the Romans and they formed like one universal church underneath Constantine who I go into historical mode was a pagan worshiper worshiped the sun kind of was trying to unify his political empire and viewed christianity as that force to unify unify his empire so so the ancient christianity ancient judaism buddhism uh, islam but more ancient stuff not how it is presently and one core belief that they all believed in is that there were different levels of the afterlife or different levels of heaven there wasn't like one heaven one hell that's a concept that actually came about probably medieval times more uh, and so there was seven levels of heaven and God dwelt at the seventh level and that was where you became perfected in God. So I view communication in the same sense that there are levels to communication. Levels to communication. There's levels to this ball game we call sales, right? I always say you have to decide which level you want to play the ball game at. Your skill level, right? Mm -hmm. So what's, the one, what's, what's one salesperson? Why are they down here compared to this salesperson's all the way up here? And they've got the same script supposedly saying the same words what's how does that even happen so i'm just always curious about how the brain works like how does it make decisions why does it why does one person struggle compared to the other so i'm fascinated by this but that's where the term seventh level came from is mm. 
is uh, ancient religions actually there you go interesting so you've like intertwined your understanding of ancient religion spirituality probably philosophy with also behavioral science and the understanding of how people work and then tie that into your own philosophy of sales but the sounds you can say philosophy i mean world religions wouldn't have anything to do with sales or anything mm. persuasion but just the the, the Phil- company. philosophy would in its own yeah. way though wouldn't it do you have mm. any particular sales philosophies that you mm. live and run your business by uh, yeah, I mean, our, our mission, our mission, core mission statement as a company is to change the way sales is perceived in society, which is a big thing for us. It's not just training you how to sell more as a salesperson or as a company to train your salespeople to sell more. It's changing the way salespeople are even viewed in society because in society in general, how are salespeople typically viewed? Higher Terrible. status or lower status? Lower. Lower status, but why? Why are they viewed at a lower status? Because, because we're not trained correctly. Because if nothing is sold, there's no such thing as an economy. So you'd think that they might be higher status because if you don't have salespeople, nothing's sold, there's no economy. You don't have an economy, there's no such thing as a society. Because if there's no economy, there's no society. There's always been an economy. Things have always been sold or bartered. That is part of society. If you don't have that, there's no such thing as society. So salespeople have a very lower status, primarily because of the way they've been trained how to communicate that runs people the other way, runs yeah. them off. So like if you go to a doctor's office tomorrow, Right, and they ask you like three questions. They might ask you two questions. Do you, you know, do your thing here with the heart scope or whatever they do? And like, okay, yeah, I think you've got some issues here. Why don't you go and take your clothes off and put this gown on and come get this exam? Do you tell the doctor like, ah, I don't know. I think I need to talk to my spouse about this. Uh, you know, I need to think it over a little bit more. I need to keep looking around. I need more research. You just say what? You're like, you trust okay, them. you just trust them higher status you yeah. already view them at higher status before you walk into the building because mm. they have something on the wall called a degree mm-hmm. so why don't salespeople have that so that's what we're what we're changing yeah it's, it's interesting <laughs> hearing you speak because you you're talking about how you had the opportunity to actually retire you know there was a period there where yeah you so-called made it just like out of my own curiosity like why get back on the tools and, and what is it about changing like why is changing the way people view sales important to you yeah you know people had always told me in my sales career that I should start my own sales training company I just never felt like I was ready for that I mean I had an 18 year career I was uh, supposedly somewhat successful as a salesperson and uh, so when I see people like that sell for two years and they start their own sales training company I'm like you you, you just don't know enough you don't have enough experience you don't have enough knowledge you know how successful were you really you're gonna go out and just train every industry how to sell more. You don't even know how to sell yourself. Like you couldn't sell out of your own industry. You, you just don't know. You don't understand the, the way the brain works. So like even after 18 years, I was like, can I really do this? Can I really train every industry? Mm. You know? And so um, I don't know. I just I just felt like the, you know I was retired for about eight nine months, ten months, somewhere in that range. And people just said, you got to start this sales training. You just dude, you got to do it. And I'm just like, I started seeing ads. I, you know, wh- one thing that really triggered me to do it was I saw a bunch of ads by some sales gurus uh, some popular sales gurus and the things that they were saying to do I'm like that doesn't even work I'm like this person obviously hasn't sold for 20 or 30 years like if I sold that way I would have made like 95% less I'd still be working I wouldn't be retired so I'm like there's a there's a there's a big gap in the market here and so we jumped in and you know hof- hopefully we're filling some of that gap you know with, with changing the way sales is perceived and when I say change the way sales is perceived that doesn't mean like you're all timid and like you know, like, oh, you know, let me know if you're interested. Like, pe- people don't buy that way either. But it's how do you raise your status? How do you raise your status in any situation? What if you're a financial advisor, and let's say you make 350000 a year, and you're talking to a billionaire? How do you get them to view you at a higher status in investing than themselves? Well, that's called situational status, you know, in psychology. So how do you do that? It's called situational status. In that situation, they view you at a higher status than they view themselves, even though you're not as financially wealthy as they are. So mm-hmm. it's little things like that. It's about how to position yourself. It's the questions you're asking and how are you asking the questions? Because your tone, right? Your tone, your, your tone is the way the prospect interprets your intention behind everything you say and ask. So if you don't understand tonality and how to shift it, depending on the context of what you're saying or asking, you're triggering different emotions in your prospect's brain. And so I want to be able to trigger the right emotions that cause them to let their guard down and open up emotionally and become open to what I'm talking about. And if you don't know how to do that, you're just kind of winging it. You're just, <laughs> you're just hoping, trying to pressure people, you're just, aren't you? <laughs> you're just hoping and praying. Yeah, and external sales pressure, you know, you're going to you play the, you're gonna have to play the numbers game with that approach because 
uh, just like when somebody externally tries to pressure you, more than likely you're gonna turn most of that down. You might go here and there because you kind of wanted it, but let's say they leave and now you have buyer's remorse. You yeah. might charge back or cancel because they externally persuaded you. They didn't know how to get you to persuade yourself. By intrinsically motivating yeah, you by asking the right questions. Yeah, intrinsically motivating. The right questions with the right tone where you emotionally open up because you know, what are the two biggest emotional drivers that causes a human to want to change? Pain and the fear of future pain. So if you can't help the prospect relive their pain of their current situation and even their past history, and then be able to have a fear that this is gonna keep happening or could happen. Let's say if I sold life insurance, it could happen, it will happen, right? Then the prospect feels no need to change. And if they feel no need to change, that's why you get objections. That's why they don't buy. Because at the, at the very core of every human being, the reason why they do not move forward with your ideas your let's say buying a home or anything like that in your industry is because they have a fear of change even though they might not like where they're at right now let's say the house they they don't like it right now they're renting they don't like paying the landlord they want to own even though they don't like that sometimes they will stay with that because it's more familiar to them than what's on the other side of change because they can't see what's on the other side of change until they actually pay you and change and so it's your job as a sales professional in any industry to help the prospect overcome that fear of change because what's on the other side of the change? Usually everything you've ever wanted. Yeah. It's just getting them over that mm. little psychological hurdle. And the uncertainty. And which, yeah, and, and it's triggering certainty. It's taking them from uncertainty where they have 100% certainty. And you can't do that by telling them things because it just goes in one ear out the other, right? It's all logical stuff. Human beings don't make decisions logically they make them emotionally. I'm like every decision you make, like I feel like a drink of water because I'm really thirsty right now. I feel that starts with my emotional side of the brain. Then I justify logic because I'm really thirsty. Yeah. I feel like being on this podcast because you guys are cool. Like every decision you make starts with your emotional side of your brain. So if you get injured, it's kind of crazy. Let's say you're in the military and you know, a grenade goes off and it injures your emotional side of your brain. You're like a vegetable. You can't decide you want to mm -hmm. go to the bathroom. You can't decide to tie your shoes. You can't make a decision to eat. So if your emotions out of your brain gets destroyed, you're, you know, you're in a vegetable state. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember your most recent emotional purchase? Uh, my most recent emotional purchase. Uh, <laughs> gee, many crickets. Uh, well, I bought my girlfriend something really nice here at the mall the other day. So, but she's well. This will come out after I give it to her. So it's like a, it's like an emerald. It's like a big emerald, like on a ring. It's not like an engagement ring or anything like that. We'll get down, we'll get down to that road. But it's like a big emerald. She loves like emeralds and, and green stuff. And that's kind of a, it's kind of an emotional purpose. It doesn't really solve a problem, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it, it, it solves an emotional need. Yes. You know, for me, for her, that type of thing. She might post it on social media. So I'm like, oh, I can't have something small. People are going to see that, you know? So it's like pressure me a little bit, external pressure. Like people are, you know, there could be a hundred thousand people that see that or 300,000 people. So i got to make it a little bit bigger, you know, mm. social status. And there so you would you say that it was the potential fear of 300 people viewing that and thinking that it was small, that sparked it? Could be solving an emotional need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See there's, and that's, that brings up a good subject because there's never been a product or service that's ever invented that doesn't solve a problem and or an emotional need. Right, like, what's your dream car that you like? Ah, oh, this. Once I get this car, it's my dream car. What is it? McLaren. How much are McLarens here? The one I want's a million. A, oh, a million Aussies. So what's that like? Seven hundred thousand American. Seven six five LT. Or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, that doesn't really solve a problem for you, right? No. Yeah, because unless you're like a, a, a Formula One racer, car driver, or something like, it doesn't really solve a problem getting around the track fast. But it solves an emotional need. Mm. Which might be status or whatever that is. It could be. Like maybe you're in a neighborhood where everybody's driving like sports cars and you're still driving your Mercedes. And you're like, oh man, like, a, you know, they've got higher status than me. It could be maybe as a kid, uh, you know, you're bullied or something and you want to show your classmates, I've arrived, I'm successful. Like it solves an emotional need. Everybody has different emotional needs. So as a salesperson, uh, when you get into that conversation, if you're, you know, if you understand how to pull that out, sales pretty much over if you don't understand to pull that off you're just a, another commoditized salesperson that they're going to now shop around so yeah. what are some questions generic questions because obviously all industries are very different that you would have in your repertoire if you were going into any industry to try and 
uncover the emotional need of your prospect and yeah. why they should be buying. Well, so we train every industry. At. So we, we have industry specific training for every industry, just so you're aware. That's why we've been able to scale so fast mm -hmm. because when I went into any uh, industry, so I sold in four completely different industries that had nothing to do with each other. I was the number one rep in each industry, typically within about three to four months, maybe five months. B2B took me six months because that was more cold call in the beginning. Number one rep in the entire industry. How did I do that? Well, it's really understand because I have a framework to follow. So it doesn't matter what the industry is. I would go into an interview with like the chief sales officer and I'd find out what are the problems that the prospects have? Like what are the problems they have, okay? So you guys think about what problems do your prospects have? Mm. Every industry have prospects that have problems and or emotional needs. So I'd find out what are their problems, what are their emotional needs? Then I'd find out what are the consequences if those problems and emotional needs don't get solved? What are the consequences to the prospect? Okay, not mm. to the company, to the prospect. prospect. Once I understood that, then I'd ask, how does your solution solve those problems and prevent those consequences from happening? Once I understand the answers to those three questions, it's easy to write questions around whatever it is because we have a framework called NEPQ, Neuro Emotional Persuasion Questions, starts with connection questions. How do I get, you know, three reasons why I'm asking connection questions. First of all, I want to take the prospect, I want to get them to let their guard down. So I have to be able to disarm the prospect where they let the guard down immediately. The second reason why I'm asking those questions is I'm taking the focus off me, putting it on them. The third reason is I'm taking them out of their way of thinking. Because what's, what's the biggest thing that a prospect thinks anytime a salesperson starts talking to them? What's the first thing going through I'm your mind? I'm being And yeah, how come. much is it going to cost? cost. Yeah. You're always thinking, how <laughs> much is it going to cost? Like that's the first thing you're thinking of, okay? So the way we were trained uh, as a psychiatrist in behavioral science is you're taught that every, every person views the world differently. Mm -hmm. Okay, so your patients, your prospects. Uh, but, and I was talking about with, on Ryan's podcast. So the way you were raised influences what you believe now. Okay, uh, maybe what religion you went to. Uh, maybe the friends you were around. Mm -hmm. uh, your aunts, your uncles, the people you associate with as a kid from four to 13 influences your worldview right now. Maybe even who you follow on TikTok mm -hmm. as a kid, you know, little kids now, influences your behaviors, your patterns, okay? And so we call that a frame. So everybody has a worldview or a way of thinking that's their frame. Your prospects have frames too, right? So their frame might be anytime they talk to a salesperson, they think, how much is this gonna cost? So how do I take them out of that frame or way of thinking and reframe them into a new frame? We call that results-based thinking. How do I take them out of how much is it gonna cost to what type of result? can I get? Because as you know, let's say a real estate agent, you guys are, you're not selling them a home, right? You're selling them the results of what that home does for them. Now mm -hmm. for every family, that's going to be different for one family. It could be, uh, now they have four or five bedrooms instead of two, cause they have three kids and it solves that problem. One problem for another family. Maybe they want like th this amazing, you know, condo here or like house up on the beach because they're retired and they want to live the good life and they want to be able to invite friends over for social status. It solves an emotional need. I mean, it's, it's different for every prospect, but that's what you're selling. You're not selling the home itself. Mm -hmm. that, you're, you're, selling the result, it you're selling the results of what the home does for them. Yeah. And most salespeople, especially I find real estate agents, I'm sure you guys are not like this, but real estate agents walk in, they're like, oh, I love the kitchen here. And one of my favorite parts is the curtains. And don't you love this? And don't you love that? I really love the thing. And it's like, you didn't even ask me what, I, what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just like, well, you're just like, throw, you know, it's like telling is not selling, but all they're doing is just showing me all the cool stuff that they like. And I'm like, well, why would I care what you like? I kind of care what I like. I don't, yeah. you know what I mean? So a lot, a lot of uh, real estate agents we noticed are, are notoriously bad at that. Most of them really haven't had really good sales training. They don't understand how the human brain works. I, I noticed that about our industry is that most real estate people have had no sales training at all. They're literally in there just talkers. Winging it. Yeah, mm. just talkers. I, I want to flip what you just said very quickly and ask yeah. you. Um, so you were talking about when an agent is selling someone a house. Yeah. But most of the time, the biggest sale for us is actually getting the business, yeah. getting the listing, sure. winning it across the dining room table. Yeah. Um, some things that you could maybe speak to for that, sure. right? to try and obviously connect with people yeah. at a deeper level. Can we give a few questions for your trust. industry? Yeah, well, is, yeah. Is, is there anything that you could probably advise people of? Like most agents, as you know, are just great talkers. They're mm. not asking questions, they're not digging deep. If you were in real estate and you were sitting across the dining room table trying to win someone's business, yeah. very quickly, what are some things that you would well, ask? Well, so, I mean, there's, we won't even talk about connection questions, but let, let's talk about how to build a gap. Yeah. Okay, how do, 
how do you find out why they're even wanting to sell the property in the first place? Like what's behind that? Because you could just say, oh, what's caused you to want to sell the property? Oh, well, just give me an example of what the last prospect said to you guys. Uh, divorce. Divorce, okay. But what's behind the divorce? Why they want to get out besides the divorce? So, so I might say like this. So, so besides the, the divorce, I mean, what's caused you to feel like you might want to sell the, the property besides just the divorce? So now I'm getting... And then it's like, oh, we don't have enough money to split it up. We have to sell the house. Yeah, and then I'm going to probe and clarify that. Oh, hold, how, how do you mean you don't have enough money to split it? So I'm, I'm, go, I'm going to mm. clarify and probe deeper in that because that's where the emotion starts to come out. If I just, if I just take that one answer and, and then it. I go on to the next question, it's still surface, surface level. You're not getting the core. You're not getting the core. You're not getting the emotions. That's, mm. where, that's where change happens. Remember, the two biggest emotional drivers cause human being to want to change, pain mm. and, and the fear, fear of future fear. pain. So if I can't help them relive their pain, they don't feel the urgency to change. And that's why you get the runaround. And then like, well, maybe we won't sell it or maybe we're gonna look at another agent. Like there's no emotion that you brought out. You trigger their emotional drivers, they don't need to look at anybody else. Mm. Quite literally, they'll go with you no matter what, doesn't matter. Because no other, no other salesperson could do that. Yeah. So they're emotionally bonded to solving their problem that you help them find and they don't understand why, but they're emotionally bonded to you. So when you say, you probing deeper can you explain a little bit more as to what that causes the prospect to feel uh so, well it, it opens them up emotionally so let's say that you let's go back to the divorce saying sure and you're like oh it you know it's just uh it's because of the divorce and and then i ask that that next question and you're like and i'll say oh look i'm really yeah we, we don't have enough money to pay each other out the property yeah has to be sold. and just say something like it's just really stressful right now because we don't have enough money to say yep. something like that we're super stressed there's not enough money to make this work stressed yeah, really stressed. In what way? Oh, it's really difficult. We just, you know, yeah. um, the relationship's breaking down because we don't have enough money. Yeah. So when you say the relationship's breaking down because you don't have enough money, how long has this been going on? Two years now. Oh, two years. Yeah. And you guys have both been living in the house together for yeah, two years? Yeah, yeah, we want to get out. What's it doing to you? Oh, I, I just, it's yeah, I'm depressed. I'm not happy. Depressed? It's ruined my life, yeah. In what way? I'm just, you know, I, I feel like I've lost myself completely lost yourself yeah tell me, can you tell me a little bit about it I, I can it's, see off, what, it's I, off the record i'm not going to say anything <laughs> what's really what's really going to I, I can see what you're doing so deeper 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 but you have to do it in a way where it's not like interrogating it's, it's no it's yeah. cur curiosity sure. and i'm here to help yeah and this is a safe see, space my tone shifts down yeah. to a softer tone if i'm like yeah. oh what, well, what's going on it's like it's trusted like, advisor yeah it's, yeah so it's, it's like I'm, I'm changing my i'm shifting my tone based on like that's a really serious thing so now yeah. i'm going to have more of a concern tone a tone that more shows compassion empathy. Tone that shows empathy, compassion causes your trust barometer to go through the roof with me where you don't feel like I'm mm, trying to ask person. sales questions. Yeah. You feel like I actually am really concerned about the consequences if this doesn't get sold. Or so, you get, yeah. so it's quite clear to me so far that your previous career in like psychiatry and you know understanding the brain and peop how people work has given you an unfair advantage to sales some would say uh you know I, ne I never became a psychiatrist because i went into sales my senior year in college and i just stayed in it basically yeah. mm. but that's what i was trained to that's what i was going to become yeah yeah there you go but, so jeremy those two things i picked up in yeah. that one is your ability to shift your eye contact and mm. i would like to learn what do you think i was doing there you were like high like Dimming, not being as you, like you, were you lowered like your level a little bit. You and know why? Because when you're when you're wanting to shift in like a concerned tone, when you go like this, it cuts your vocal cords off and makes you feel it talks softer. Yeah. Try screaming down here. It doesn't work. Doesn't work, right? Or like if you're on the phone, oh, what actually happened? You can't scream down here. It's harder. Mm -hmm. Scream up here. So unless you've mastered tonality, like I can still have a concerned tone up here, but most people can't. Yeah. So it's just a, it's just a way like. It shows that you're like oh like something and you're wrong. leaning in as well i'm leaning in so a lot of sales trainers will be like oh you got to mirror them and do whatever they do i'm like uh okay you can but i'm going to teach you how to get them to mirror you mm -hmm. like i'm going to show get them, them to how you. to do what i'm doing yeah. yeah because if they do what i'm doing they're emotionally bonding and connecting with me rather than me doing it the other way it's like then you're reverse, leading the reverse conversation mirroring. yeah just a different way to look at it so how does the script play out when you've got them to a state like you had there where you're reverse mirroring, you've gotten deep. How do you then go from deep conversation to a signed contract? Yeah, so, so I mean, so it's a process. You're not just gonna say, that you, you, 
it's not enough just to help them find out what their real problems are and emotionally open up. I've also got to get them to see what the future looks like once the problems are solved. Yeah. We call those solution awareness questions. So then you go into like solution awareness where you're basically finding out like, okay, so let's say that we come in, we're able to sell the, the property, uh, you, you, know, I'm, you know, let's say 60, 90 days, somewhere in that range, and don't get angry at me if it takes a little bit longer. Let's say we do that. How do you, you know, besides the cash coming you guys, yeah. How do you see getting rid of the property off your shoulders really helping you the most though? Yeah, it'd be great. I can just move on with my life after that. Moving on with your life. What, what, you, what would that look like? What would it look like? I, mean, just, I don't have a lot of, I've got, to, I've got to go and say, but what does that do for you just to move on your life? Oh, mate, it'd be great. I'd be, you know, be able to spend time with my friends again. And yeah. I feel like I'd be free yeah. and happy. And I'd be How able to do it. How long have you not things? been able to spend time with your friends though? Oh, I just, you know, we haven't had the money for me to go and do the things I want to do yeah. with this weight on my shoulders. And what, what were they, what were your friends trying to do that you couldn't do? Oh, travel, you know, go to do different things and yeah. Okay. So the, the traveling is important to you then? Very. Yeah. And I'd probably even go further than that, but I'm not going to do that because we're on a podcast, yep. but wow. um, it, it's, there's a lot more to that. Like I'm asking them questions where now he, he or she feels like they're seeing and they're feeling what the future looks like once the newfound problems are solved. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to rip that away from them next by asking them what's called a consequence question that gets them to defend themselves on why they have to change and change now. So you're getting them to close themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much easier. What's, what's an example of a consequence well, question? Well, a consequence question, it depends on the context, right? Because if you just use the same consequence question for everybody, it's not going to land because your situation is way different than yours mm -hmm. compared to hers, compared to him. There are every situation is... So what you have to learn as a salesperson is to tie in what answers they give you into the next questions you're tweaking the questions as they're giving you that data but it, with NEPQ the formula like I show you the format and formula to plug in the data they give you so it's like you still have the framework in your brain of where you're going but you're taking what they're saying and plugging it into your questions so they feel like you understand them mm -hmm. they feel like they're talking to their best friend rather than just asking generic surface level questions so let's say that um, well, I might do this. So, so for you, like, why look at doing this now? I mean, besides just the divorce, getting the cash, like for you guys, why look at doing this now though? Like, why not push it down the road? Like a lot of people do who end up, you know, just, just going over and over and they never get out of the house. You know, that might be a consequence question. Okay. That's called an identity frame where I'm getting you to identify away from the negative. Right. Is what I just did there. I right. probably, uh, I probably change a little bit of that in there, but I might say, well, you know, and, I, I, so after you're like, oh, it'd be great. I, you know, I, I want to do this. I'm going to go with my friends. Well, well what happens if you don't though? Mm. Like if you just keep the house and, it, and, and you don't find somebody that can actually sell it quickly. Mm. What if you get the wrong real estate agent and they don't know how to market it? Like, what are you going to do what happens then? at that point? Yeah. So I start off a little bit more challenging. I mean, you certainly sound motivated. Now I'm like putting it back on them. So I'm getting you to defend yourself on why you feel like you need to change now, yes. not push it down the road. And then you're I mean, not you closing anyone. They're telling you <laughs> why they should do it. Yeah, they're closing themselves. Now, there's some other things at the end. I've got to ask them commitment questions to get them to commit the next step. I'll show you those in a second. But like, and there's a lot more to this than what I'm showing you here. Like, I've skipped like 99% of the yeah, conversation. Yeah. But I might say, so what happens if you, if you don't do anything about this, though, and you get some real estate agent that doesn't really know how to market on their social media, and it just sets here, like, what are you guys going to do? Oh, it'd be terrible. We'd be stuck in the same situation in three months time. And I couldn't bear that. Well, what about her? What's she going to do? Even worse. What is she going to do to you? Yeah. Well, we don't want to go there. Could be trouble for you. Be sleeping on the couch again. Exactly. You know, so I might be saying something like yeah, uh, whatever. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, I'm probably going to go through like at that point, I'm going to say, well, what I can do is, uh, you know, I'm kind of go over like uh, a plan that we, we use to sell properties like yours with other clients. Would that help you if I went over that? And I might go through a little presentation about how you're going to do it, Mark Home, blah, 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 blah. And then at the end, uh, and I don't know how you guys bring up your fees here compared to they do in the United States, but at the end, after I've done that, what it's going to be, all that stuff, I might lean in and say, do you feel like this could be the answer for you? I might, that might be a commitment question or like, do you, would you feel comfortable working with us and selling your property so you can have that time with your friends? That might be a commitment question, right? And they're like, yeah, I do. Hold on. Why do you feel like you would though? Oh, because we like you because of this, because of that, because of that. And then I might, I'm just wrapping it up because closing is like just a couple questions at the end. It's not like this whole dramatic process that most sales trainers have. It's like 30% of sale. To me, it's like 1% of the sale. Because they've already closed themselves, right? I've already got them to self actualize If you've asked the right questions. Everything. Yeah, for sure. It's easy. So then at the end, I'm like, well, I don't really have anything else to go over with you. It looks like we covered the basis of what you're looking for. Really, the next step would be 
is we would, you know, whatever your next step is, we'd have, you, we'd, we'd have you authorize the, what, what's your agreement called? Uh, form six. Form six, I wouldn't call it. Listing documents. Uh, yeah, we'd have you authorize the listing agreement that gives us permission to get it listed so we can sell the property. Notice how I'm like tying them authorizing it with getting it listed and selling it, not just sign the document. Mm. Where so that's just for you, it's for them. See, I'm giving them the benefit by authorizing it. Does that make sense? Let you act on So your off. next step is just have you authorize the listing agreement. That gives us permission to go ahead and list it. And then the next step, so we can sell it for you. And then the next step is we would stage the property, blah, 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 blah. Would that be appropriate? Yeah. Yeah. So it's the easy stuff. It's just the logical next step. Mm. Our, they've already internalized all that. It's easy to close at the end. I feel like this is the perfect part of the discussion to ask you about closing. Okay. Yeah. Um, now... What I notice is a lot of people have a lot of clutter in their mind around closing and they mm. are worried about, and I don't ever believe in pressuring people and maybe situationally appropriate. However, most of the time, if you've, as you've said, asked the right questions and done the right things, you won't need to pressure people. They'll effectively close themselves. Pressuring doesn't work that well. It's just, it doesn't. It's a, it's a numbers game at and that pe point. People go cold overnight if you There's do a that. different, and I'll come back to that saying yep. what you're going to ask. This is really important. There's a difference between externally pressuring a prospect. Mm -hmm and triggering internal tension to where they them. feel so much tension where it drives them to change and change yep. now. Yep. That's the difference in pers And the, Remember I said there's levels to this ball game we call sales. Once you learn that skills, you're up here at these levels compared to everybody else, like mm -hmm. numbers game and down here. Yeah, well down there's like pressure and hard sell and do whatever you can to get numbers the game. Numbers game. And then up there's like emotionally leading people on a journey to make a decision. Yeah, where it's like, e it's, a, it's easy. It's it's. Like it's more I'm fun. more about preventing objections in the in their mind because objections are not something that are planned out by the prospect. It's something that you're triggering by triggering uncertainty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you trigger uncertainty, that's why people procrastinate. That's why they don't move forward. So what do you think you need to do in the sales process to create more certainty? So I've got this belief that if you can answer all of your prospects' potential questions before they answer them, then you'll have a really high level of certainty from them because you obviously. How look do you like know your prospects know what questions to ask you though? Well, there's probably generic ones for each industry. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah. But the, now, here's here's one thing I would caution on that because they're going to know some questions to ask, but maybe they don't know all the questions they should be asking mm -hmm. you. So there's there's some things there because most prospects don't really know what they need when you first start talking to them. And most salespeople are notoriously bad to selling to a prospect's needs. How many people knew, like Steve Jobs said it best, like nobody knew they needed an iPhone? before it came out yeah mm. and all of a sudden they did because people buy more on what they want not what they need and then they justify it. and they justify it okay so it's triggering emotional drivers because let's say that if a prospect if you said like hey wh wh what are some challenges you're having with selling the property or whatever for your industry and they're like oh the last agent didn't do this and you're like oh well we're better this is the way we do it and that's all you sell on like you're not really building much of a gap from from where they are compared to where they want to be so what I want to do is I can expand on that as one problem, but I want to help that prospect find two or three or four or five other problems they didn't realize they had. And that builds such a big gap that even if they feel like I can solve this one problem myself, they're like, there's no way I can solve the other four. They have to go with you. Okay. You see the difference there? Yep. So you but most, most salespeople just sell on like, like what are problem. some challenges you're having? They'll say one and they'll sell to them. Like, this is how I can fix that. I need to help them find four or five other problems too because then they just view you, they view you as the mm. expert. Like this person knows my business. They know me better than I know myself. So it's like your ability to articulate your client's problems mm -hmm. will increase their certainty get, and you being the yes, solution. Help, help get them get the problems out of their mind that maybe they haven't even, even thought about or considered. Yeah. And my questions allow them to be like, oh shit, I never even thought about that. That's, yeah, we have that same issue. And you do that through the problem awareness phase. Situation questions as well, because I'm helping them understand what their real situation is, because most prospects don't, don't understand what the real situation is. And mm. most salespeople will ask a question and the prospect will be like, oh, I don't, I don't know, I haven't thought about it. And then they'll just go on to the next question. And they didn't find out their situation. So like, hang on. like. Why or, haven't you thought about it? Or I might say, well, oh, well, if you really thought about it, what would it be? Mm. And that's just a follow-up question of that mm. where mm. pretty much every brain is forced to think about, well, if you really thought about it, what would it be? Well, and then their, <sighs> mind, their head will go up like this or go <laughs> down like this, and they'll, it forces their brain to think about it. Interesting. You really are, can't are you come watching out of what if the brain goes up or down? Does that tell you different? Not necessarily. No. Right. no. I mean, you got to be careful with body language. I'm really good friends with Mark Bowden. He's a body language expert. If you've ever heard of him, he's uh, he's a great guy. I had him on a show about six months ago. 
Uh, if you look on YouTube, he's got a, a YouTube channel with a Chase Hughes, an FBI negotiator, and some other uh, FBI. It's called the Behavioral Channel. Uh, there's like millions of views of every show on that. But they analyze like people like that are in courtrooms, if they're lying or telling the truth, or they'll analyze politicians. You know, the way they hand, you know, move in to like shake hands. You know, like President Trump will like come out here and like try to like you know pull you in like this. And so, you know, somebody trained Justin Trudeau. This is back in the Trump administration. They showed me this. It's really amazing. They trained Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada. When Trump comes out, move in quick and, like, grab him like this and put your left hand on his shoulder. It, like, interrupt his pattern. And he did it beautifully. I, I don't get into political beliefs, but I just love watching communication styles. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that was really good what he did there. Interrupt his pattern? Huh? He interrupted Trump's pattern because Trump, like, wants to bring you out here That's and, like, pull you in dominant dominate you so he wants to, he wants to so psychologically every every president's different right so everybody has their weaknesses and strengths you nobody's perfect but psychologically trump wants to dominate you like he he's dom he's a billionaire mm -hmm. right he's like a uh, high status he wants to show you he has higher status than you so how does somebody like justin trudeau show him that he has at least equal status okay mm -hmm. that's one thing by not letting trump dominate pull you in so like you control the handshake so trudeau controlled the handshake so instead of like when Trump was out coming out here like this, Trudeau moved quick, went in like this, and got like real quick, and went like this and grabbed his hand and put his hand on his left shoulder like this to show him like I'm your equal status. Wow. You see what I'm saying? It's status framing. Yeah. Status framing. There you go. Rank framing, authority framing. I know, weird stuff. And you guys are like, framing. what? These guys are crazy. How would that yeah. play out in a sales role? Uh, it just depends on the pattern context. Interrupt. Give, me a, give me a context. Would you be using pattern interrupts through the process? Uh, sure. So let's say if I'm cold calling, I'm a real estate agent. Now I'm not sure how you guys do it here, but like, and I, I know we train company real estate agents here cause I know we have clients that they make tweaks and stuff, but in America, so we might, we would, let's say you're cold calling expired listings. Okay. What would the average, you guys do that? Do you call my favorite? You, okay. Oh, yeah. what, what do you guys say? Like words out of your mouth, first words out of your mouth. Um, they answer. Hello. Hi, Jeremy. It's Hannon. Um, mm -hmm. Mate, I've been watching your property very closely. I know it's been on the market for some time. I'm curious, has it sold? Yeah. Okay, and they typically would say what? No. No, it hasn't. And you say? Okay, no worries, mate. I'm really concerned. I've been watching it quite closely. It's a beautiful home. It seems to be priced well. What seems to be going on there? Yeah, what do they say then? And then they'll usually blame the agent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rather than take responsibility for either their price or their marketing okay. being incorrect. Yeah. And then That's I'll, I'll, I'll then that leverage that into an appointment. Yeah. Okay. Good. So typically, when we when we do um, when we do that for real estate agents, we have them print off the expired listings. Yep. Okay. So and we have them like have the oh, papers the in their hands because it's a pattern rub. Just hearing papers. Okay. And so when they answer the phone, yeah, is this John? Yeah, John. Hey, it's it's Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy Miner uh, with X Y Z. I'm holding a copy of the expired fired listings in my hand on your home at 55 willow lane i was wondering if you could help me out for a moment and like sure I, wow it's just a pattern rub because i'm and holding, holding it and roughly. holding a copy and why are they making sure they can hear the paper yeah. through yes. the phone as well because it's a pattern that's rubbed. great yeah. i love it's, that they're like what does he have in his hand this is pattern rubbed what okay? am i missing it's here interrupting the pattern i'm interrupting the pattern of what they think's going on okay? real estate agent buying now, if, let's say if they're like an investor calling a uh let's say a, a home that's about to go into foreclosure in america that's a big industry we train as well we would have them print off the property tax records of the home. Really hard to hang up and like have a copy of the, yeah, is this John? Yeah, John, hey, it's, it's, uh, it's James, uh, J James Miller. I'm holding a copy of your, of your property uh, tax records on your home there at uh, 50, I think it's a 55 uh, Willow Lane property there. I wonder if you could uh, help me out for a moment. And they don't know well, if you're a clerk, they don't know if you're from the government. Holding a copy of the property tax records, mm. it's like, because it, in America, you can go print off property tax records yeah. in every county. Why Why are you asking the question? I'm wondering if you could help me out. What's that well, doing? Well, I'll show you next. Okay. It's just it's just a pan up. They're yep. like, sure, how can I help you? <sighs> yeah. Because you're asking a question. You don't want to just do a statement and then yeah. pause. And they're like, oh, who is this? Like, you're, because you're, you're triggering resistance. Yeah. And then I'm going to push them away a little bit. I might say, well, I'm not even sure if it makes sense for us to talk. So I'm pushing them away. I've got it like I can't sound like I'm going in to sell them. I've and got to that when push them away a little bit. Like I'm <laughs> detached. Okay. Well, I'm not even sure if it makes sense to talk. Um, I represent now. Let's say if it's on the wholesale side, uh, like investor side, then I'll show you the the one for real estate. I'm not even sure if it makes sense. And the whole time I'm looking at the papers, crinkling the papers, like I'm reading the papers. So I'm slowing down. You don't sound like a typical salesperson is trying to talk fast, right? Because you're always taught to talk fast on a cold call. So your, your prospects, the guards always up, right? You're, you're triggering flight or flight mode. 
So I'm like, yeah, um, and I'm not even sure if it makes sense for us to talk. I represent a group of uh, five buyers and they're looking to, they're looking to purchase, I think it's like four or five different properties there, like in your four block area. And after they had me look at like the property size and lot and what you had it listed before, uh, they had me reach out to see if you guys would be, I don't know, like opposed to having a brief conversation about maybe selling the property. Would you guys be against talking about that? He asked Nat to get a no because it makes yeah. them feel more safe. Chris yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah, it's great. I love that. But social dynamics. Yeah. So dynamics. I'm friends with Chris. So yeah. I've spoken on a lot of stages with Chris. He's a great guy. But uh, Chris would have learned that from social dynamics. Social so dynamics. you're ta just little things that you're taught, like behavioral patterns, how to interrupt. Some of it comes from NLP as well, where you're taught that it's actually in a lot of contexts better to get the prospect to say no because it leads to the yes. Yeah. Now, in that context though. And right? no feels a lot more emotionally safe, safe to them, doesn't it? Especially yeah. on a cold call. Yeah. So on a cold call, I'm trying to get them to say no. I might say like fundraising. Are, are you are you against letting them take back the White House this year? No, I'm not. I, I'm not going to let that happen. Like, it's just like against. Are you opposed? Was, would it be a crazy would you be idea? Would to? If I was to like, would it be completely unrealistic? There's just different things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you be against me starting a cold call as, hey, Jeremy, it's just uh, Dan here. Have I caught you at a bad time? I would be because that's what most salespeople do. Because yeah. like, who, they're going to be like, well, uh, the yeah, sales radar this? goes yeah, off, doesn't who, it? Who is this? What's yeah. going on? And instantly the guard's up. Okay. Yeah. Now notice what I did there. Very important. The very first words when I introduced myself, I said, it's, it's James, J James Tonality Miller. Tonality goes right up. Yeah. What did, what tone does that sound like? Familiar. Familiarity. You, we know each so other. So the whole time the prospect's brain is, who is this? Who is this? Sound How similar. do I know you? You're not, yes, they're not going to say, who is this? Because no. it's rude. They feel like embarrassed. And they're trying they're, to work it out. Yes. But you've interrupted the pattern. I've interrupted the pattern by the familiar tone. But if I'm like, hey, is this John? Hey, James. It, it, John is James Miller with XYZ Company. Clink. I'm holding a copy of sounds like a salesperson, sounds like a telemarketing. So the pattern sounds the same in their brain. So their survival part of their brain has built up human beings. We built up defensive mechanisms that anytime we feel like we're being sold to, cause we're constantly marketed and sold to all the time. Mm. TV ads, social media ads, radio ads, billboards, you're being sold to, all, you walk by the mall, you're sold to all the time. So you, we built up uh, defenses in our brain, survival part of our brain that when we feel we're being sold to, we, we instantly go service level and like fight or flight mode. So I'm interrupting that pattern. I'm, a, I'm making sure it doesn't happen in their brain. So their guards down. Guards down, way easier to sell than the guards up. Because mm -hmm. now you're competing against mm -hmm. the guard coming down. I'm like, just do it where the guard stays down. And when I always talk about the ABDs of selling, always be disarming, always means always. Like you're always keeping their guard down. It's not at the beginning. I'm always keeping you the guard down. You can go up down. at a moment's notice, you can't up, You could say the one wrong word. Game over. Wrong tone, get defensive, yeah. and it's over. Can you recover? Huh? Can you recover from the point where the sure, guy Sure, you up? can. But it's, it's just going to be more of a numbers game because you're not going to be able to recover with everybody, most mm -hmm. people. And I'm not saying I sold 100% of prospects, but you know, was there a reason why in every industry I sold typically 10 times what even good salespeople sold? Yeah, because I understood these type of techniques. I want to go back to something that you mentioned at the start for the first couple of years of seventh level. It was just yeah. you and your assistant. Yeah, yeah. So you were grinding it out, right? Obviously doing the work. You obviously had a vision of what the business was going to be. Sure. What did you keep telling yourself through that period to make yourself keep going and not decide, hey, that, this is too hard? Yeah, I'd always go back to, you ever seen that Kevin Costner show, uh, Field of Dreams? If you build it, they will come. Yep. It's an American thing. You're the baseball, yep. you're the cornfield. Yep. If you build it, they will come. That was always in the back of my mind. If you build it, they will come. That's what I was thinking. It takes a while. Look, I was disappointed the first year and a half before really anybody knew who we were because I was so successful in my sales career. I'm just like, well, of course, it's gonna translate into business. Maybe but not. It's a lot. it's a lot different, you know? I, you know, for a couple of organizations I was in, I became the vice president of sales for the whole company. These are big firms, uh, chief sales officer. That's completely different. To your and own actually business. owning the business and running it completely different. You know, now we have CEO, we have all those people that run all the business. I don't really do a lot in there, right? I'll jump in here and there with like recruiting. If we need like a big, big fish or something, we're trying to recruit or something, I'll jump in there. But for the most part, I'm sticking to the new content, more sales training. Uh, we have like 37 different sales training programs. I'm creating a master's course in cold calling right now, you know? So there's always things that I'm working on keynotes and, you know, podcasts. And so it keeps you busy. Yep. How has the 
difference between owning a business and being a master at sales prior, how has that shifted your fulfillment levels? Or has it not? Mm, shifted my fulfillment levels. These are really engaging questions, gentlemen. I like this. Um, how is, has it fulfilled my... Because it, from yeah. my perspective, if you're killing it as a salesperson to then yeah. start a new organization from the bottom, like surely mm. that would take an impact on your, your life quality. Yeah. You? I mean, to me, to me, to, to change the way sales is perceived, I can't do that if I'm just a salesperson, right? But if, I'm, if I have an impact, we... We just got a stat the other day that we control about eight point, I think it's eight point three to eight point five percent of all the business to consumer market in the world now, as far as Australia's trainers, which is a lot. And how long into the business? Uh, we've been about five point five years. Wow, that's great. But a lot well of it has been just our social media presence, really since twenty twenty two. That was the first time I did a reel. I didn't even have an IG account until January twenty twenty two. My daughter, my oldest daughter. Cammy, she's like, yeah, dad, you, you should do these uh, reels on IG. I'm like, what's IG? She's like, Instagram. I'm like, oh, Instagram. I was like, I don't have an account. She's like, well, you just do these reels and stuff. And she's like, you'll, you'll go viral. That's what she told me. I'm like, oh, okay. And that's <laughs> literally where, where we got even, you know, probably 10 times bigger, 2022, 2023, now 2024. Yeah. You might not even heard me about me three years ago. I did. Oh, did you? I you're, saw the first couple. You're there. First I couple. There. First couple. There you go. But, uh, you know, it just, it takes time and it takes, uh, you have to have the right team. You have to have the right team. And as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, you have more cash flow to bring in people that are maybe more talented. But you still have a lot of your core people that move with the business. Like they gain more skills. They develop as well. And they move up in the ranks as well that have been with you from the very beginning. And that's exciting to see. Mm. It's only the ones who never want to learn anything, never want to grow. And eventually, you know, like uh, when I, um, I worked for my first corporate career when I was in door to door sales, uh, with a company called Vivint. They're really, really big in America. Like the Utah Jazz play in, basketball team play in the Vivint Center. So it's a huge alarm company now. And uh, the CEO at that time, Todd Peterson, he's, you know, they've been bought up by Blackstone now. Uh, I, think it's, yeah, I think it's Blackstone. Uh, would always tell us like that, you know, when you start your business, it's like a train station, right? You're gonna have a certain people on board with you when you start. And then you're gonna go a little bit of ways, you're gonna have a, a stop. And there's gonna be some of those original people to get out. They're gonna go do something different. It, maybe they don't like you anymore. Maybe they have a, a different vision or dream. There's going to be new people that come on board. And then you're going to go a little bit more. And there's going to be another stop. And there's going to be some people that, that get out of the, the train. And then some new people that come on board. Maybe they're even better at that position. And it just goes all the way to the very end. And he's like, you, you'd be surprised the people you thought were just going to be with you that were at the very beginning sometimes don't necessarily make it to all the way to the end. It just, it just never know. So it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, thing as you as you grow your business because we have close to 200 uh, people on the team now 200 people. where yeah. would you like to take it where would i like to take it as far as size revenue goals well, we're already the largest business to consumer sales training company in the world based on annual revenues not grandma saying it thank you grandma <laughs> uh but based on annual revenues we're the largest b2c sales training company and we're ranked third overall largest between b2b and b2c so we're pretty well already up there uh, but we're going to take that a much larger. However, we're also getting into other avenues like uh, staffing and recruiting. It's a big space that we train in. And we have millions of followers that are salespeople. We have hundreds of thousands of individual salespeople clients that have been through our advanced courses. Uh, we have an email list of like 1.3 million salespeople. So we have a lot of assets where companies are already coming to us, offering to pay for certified salespeople that have gone through our programs to get placed with them. Smart. We just don't have the foundation set up and the right people to run mm -hmm. that yet, but that's something that will roll out in 2026. You so that'll be a lot of the biggest recruiting agencies in America anyways are doing five to 10 billion a year in revenue. Five to 10 billion. Yeah, there's no sales training company that does that. Not Do even you close. see yourself as that being a goal for you? It'll be a back end that we'll have with the company. The front end will always be sales training. Yeah. But it just makes sense. To you cross know, companies are already coming to us. We have hundreds of companies every month that come to us yeah, right now. We, sure. just don't, we don't have it organized enough to, you know, because in, in the way it works in America is like each salesperson, you know, it's, it's a percentage of like their base salary plus overall average commission for like two, you know, a year. There's a percent of that. So it might be 25 to 35,000 per salesperson that's placed a good salesperson. So it's a, it's, it can be a big uh, space, but it'll be more on the back end thing. The front end will always be the sales training sales, for sure. Do you have, yeah. what would success look like for you? Is there an ultimate revenue evaluation? How do you know when you- uh, Yeah, when I mean, our, our first uh, major evaluation is to be evaluated as a billion dollar organization. A billion? Yeah, for sure. Sounds like a, a good yeah. number. Why not, uh, like why not five billion? 
Uh, that's just the first. So there, there might be an exit plan to sell a portion of the business. We'll never sell the majority of the business because I always keep it uh, in my family and stuff like that. But there might be a, a play there in a little bit, you know, probably five years down the road to sell some of the organization. Sounds so, like a pretty but good not, number. not the majority, though. And it's, it's my baby. Yep. Awesome. Do you see yourself seventh level up? Do you, has your skill level over the last five and a half years owning the business increased as you've been teaching? God, I would owning? hope so, yeah. Or do you feel like... <laughs> I would hope so. Like, that could because be you've been doing it for so long, do you feel yeah. like the progression at which you upskill is still there or is it kind of I'm like always learning. Like if you, if, you, if you talk to anybody in my company, they know that I'm always learning. So I still, I still go through sales training programs every month, probably five a month. Oh, for Five sure. a month. Yeah, who, for sure. That's who, yeah. who are you learning from now at your point in your career? I learned more, like when I was in sales, I learned from a lot of sales trainers, but it was more like tonality and body language experts. Yep. Like Brian and Tracy. More psychologists. And like I know Brian. I mean, Brian, Brian was the first seminar I ever went to. Uh, good friends with Brian. I, I pretty much, I know all those guys. Um, there might be some things that I'll read. Let's say if I read a Brian Tracy book or I'll go through one of his programs and I might find something like, oh, I really, really like that. If I just shifted the tone there, into more of a concern tone mm. and then change around this word and this word to make it more neutral because it's a little bit too early to be assumptive. I think it'll work a little bit better for what I do. So you're fighting for the inches now. I'm always, that's what selling is. Yeah. It's, it's like any sport, right? Like what's your favorite sport to watch? What's your favorite sport? The wrong person. I don't watch any. Let's say basketball. Yeah. Could so basketball, fun? fighting for inches, right? Yeah. You can make the shot or miss it by half inch. Mm. It's the same thing in selling. You, you you can make the sale or not by little inches, little 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 things, mm -hmm. little nuances that you just haven't learned yet. You know, mm -hmm. how do you pace out your questions? Yeah, where the prospect it hits them more emotionally and gets them to internalize what you're asking instead of talking really fast mm -hmm. all the time. So most salespeople ask questions so fast it gives the prospect no time to internalize what they ask and they get a knee jerk surface level answer. But that's the salesperson's fault because they ask a question too fast. So how do you verbal pace the question out and pause right before a few words you want their brain to focus on? Mm. That's a nuance, right? Oh, so for you, why is that so important to you now though? That is the word I want you to focus on. Because I said, why is that so important? And then I verbal paused, so important to you now though? Or I could say the same question. Well, for you, why is that so important to you now though? And now you your now. brain focuses on now. why do I need to do this now? That's a nuance, right? Nuance. I said the same exact word, same question. I just verbal paused and focused on two different words. And your brain will think of two different things now because I can control that by how I verbal paste it out. That's a nuance that you want to learn. Mm. <laughs> so let's take it back a moment yeah. for people that aren't in a stage of their career where they're learning the little nuances because they've got to build the fundamentals and yeah. when you're starting a career in sales or business it's not just learning the skill or the art of sales but also personal development takes place where you'll read the tony robbins you'll go to the events out of everything you can do whether it be personal development learning sales techniques actually putting in the work yeah. what would be the foundation you tell people to i mean start? i would go to, i mean if you're in sales you need to learn sales skills first because it, it, the personal development stuff is great i mean meditating's great uh writing your journal's great all that stuff's great but it's not going to help you somewhere no it's the words you use you need skill set. it's the questions you ask it's how you use your tone that causes the prospect to either let their guard down or stay guarded all the mindset stuff is great, but it's not going to help you sell more when the prospect says hello. If you don't know what to say or ask, you know, let's say your cold calling approach works 10 times better than another person that goes to every Tony Robbins event, but when they talk, they talk too fast. They, they don't know the right words to say on the cold call and they get hung up, hung up, hung up, hung up. Where does your confidence level go? Back down to where your skill yeah. level is. Back down. People always ask me, What's, how do I gain more confidence as a salesperson? I'm like, you gain more skill level. How do you, how can you gain more confidence in anything if you don't have the skill? If you don't have the skill. Competence That's like confidence. asking a neurosurgeon, how do I get better at brain surgery? You learn how to do it better. I don't, you see, it's the same <laughs> question because when you're selling a lot, where's your confidence go? Right up. High level. But when you're not selling that much because you don't have skill level, you can get pumped up every day. You can go to personal development after personal development. And I love personal development events. I'm going to a Tony Robbins event in December. December? For six days. Yes. Which I love it. Destiny? It's, yeah, it's the one in December. Yeah, me and Kayla are going. And so, but the, th the problem with that approach is so many people think 
that personal love, getting pumped up is going to cause you to sell more because you're energetic and you're excited all the time. It doesn't translate into results. You're going to you're going to really mm -hmm. go through the numbers game. You're going to burn out because you have to work crazy hours just to make a living. Whereas if you learn the skills, you could reduce your hours and make five times more and actually be happy about it because your brain, human beings are not built to take rejection. And it doesn't matter how many sales trainers say, get thicker skin, get, <laughs> get, you know, get tougher with objections. Human beings are not built for that. No, hu like, let's say you're single, but you know, go back to your single days, long time ago, okay? Uh, let's say you walked up to your partner at some event and she rejected you. You wouldn't like that, man. You'd be like, damn, that sucks. You wouldn't be like, I'm just gonna go through numbers game. I'm gonna go talk to six <laughs> more girls. You're just not built that way. Mm. But if you had the skill level to be able to communicate with her, right? And she let her guard down, you started having a great conversation. You're seeing success, your confidence goes through the roof, right? It's the same thing in sales. Just human behavior 101, mm. just communication in any aspect. Mm -hmm. That's why communication. communication skills are the number one most important thing you have to learn if you wanna have success in anything. Look where the average billionaire started. Not, not like I'm talking self-made billionaires, all sales, sales for the most part, all sales. So it sounds like sales and communication, same thing. Is is yeah. the number one dating skill. relationships, everything uh, in life, government to government. It's all about communicating. Why do wars start? Lack of communication. Mm -hmm. Don't understand each other. Try. They each say they're evil. You know, Ukraine says Russia's evil. Russia says Ukraine's evil. Like why? 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 But they none of them view themselves as the evil person. Mm. Right? Did did uh, did Germany view themselves as like the evil, you know, dictator country? No, they thought they were doing the right thing, right? That doesn't mean they weren't, but that's how they viewed themselves, right? Nobody believes that they're the evil one. If you were starting <laughs> again from yeah. zero, knowing what you know and having access to the resources and going through the learnings that you've gone through, what would be the first, let's just say, book, course, podcast, whatever that you would lean towards to improve your sales skills? Well, I can't say mine because that would sound really biased. Um, but if you could, though, what product or program would it be? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would sound really awkward on a podcast. Uh, you know, I think I think salespeople, like, you know, most salespeople, they make the mistake of like, I'm going to learn how to sell after I get hired. And I'm just like, how does that make any sense? Like, what profession can you do that? Can you be an engineer and like go learn how to build bridges without being educated how to build bridges before? Mm -hmm. Probably not a good idea for the people driving on those bridges, first. right? You got to go to university. Because I always ask this to be like, how many years How many years did you go to uh, school for sales and persuasion? Zero. Oh, zero. Right, but think about any other profession that you can say that. Five, six, Lawyers, seven years. Yeah. Doctors, attorneys, police, military. And the I, crazy I, didn't thing go any, I didn't go through any uh, any schooling for how to shoot these weapons. They just dropped me off here in the middle of Afghanistan. Hopefully, <laughs> just duck, you know, duck when somebody shoots. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. But that's the reason why salespeople have the highest attrition of any industry in the world. Mm -hmm. Because they're not taught how to do it until they get the job. Yeah. So even if you start studying sales three, six months before, and you at least have some fundamentals down. You understand basic human psychology and just a few basic questions and a few basic tonality things, and you get that job, you're going to be far better off than the person that gets hired who doesn't hardly know anything about it because they're more than likely not going to last because they can't go through rejection because mm -hmm. they're going to be rejected all the time because they have no skill level and the boss maybe is feeding them leads or something and now they're spending too much money and they're gone. Whereas the other salesperson might have been studying sales three to six months before, more than likely you're probably going to overcome that learning curve five times faster and start seeing results quicker. The boss looks at you and is like, wow, you know, that's impressive, more promotions quicker. It's just, it's all on your skill level. I, I, it's fascinating to me that salespeople, you know, if I'm gonna get into sales, like I, I wanna learn how to sell a little bit before I get my first job for sure. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. What's life as a black belt salesperson like now? I don't know if I'm a black belt, I'm, I'm trying to get up there. If I you, look at black belt sales as maybe like perfection. So you know, that's a there's no this, such thing. In, in, Assuming in you're life. not black belt, yeah. what would need to change or what skills would you need to develop to become black belt? Well, tonality is probably your most important skill that tonality. I don't think. Oh, yeah, because that's how the prospect interprets why you're asking the question. Yeah. It's not about what you say. It's about how you say it. It's about how you say it. Well, look at look at a sales floor. Let's say you got 100 salespeople in there. Why is this one person outselling everybody else five to one? Using the same and they're script. And the, they're saying the same thing on the script. How they say it. It's how they say it. Is how they ask it, but but deeper than that, is it the tension, the intention behind how they say it? 
Well, it's the tone. So the, we always we always train. There's there's five. There's a lot of different tonalities. But if you want to become like a one percent salesperson industry, there's five core tones you have to master. There's a curious tone. Okay. There's a confused tone. I'll show you why I want to do that in certain contexts. There's a challenging tone. Can't use a challenging tone the first two minutes. I don't have any trust or credibility. That's more later. Okay. There's a concerned tone, a tone that shows empathy. There's a playful tone, right? So let's say that, do you ever get on Zoom with any prospects? Or yeah, more a lot of mine Zoom. So let's say you get on Zoom and they're like, hey, how are you doing today? What do you say? What's the first word you You could say a pattern interrupt. What would you say? I'd just say, what do you normally say? No. I'm not going to say anything wrong. I'm just if, saying, what if, do you say? If, they're like, hey, how are you doing today? They say yourself. it to you. Good yourself. Yeah, good yourself. Now that doesn't, that doesn't hurt you, but it doesn't really help you. It's yeah. just kind of there. So how do I get them to let their guard down? Well, one thing I want to do is I want to do something that releases dopamine in their brain because that causes you to laugh. Okay. So scientifically I'm doing this. So you might say, Hey, how are you doing today? Like, Oh, you know, just trying to stay out of trouble. What about you? Are you getting in trouble over there, George? Oh no, I'm not getting in trouble. At least dopamine. They laugh. Walls down. Guards down. Hmm. So I'm doing that not to be the class clown or to be funny. I'm doing it to help the prospect get their guard down. You know, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of this. There was two, I'm not going to name the names. It's kind of interesting. There was two alpha, just out, you know, in America, we call them alpha males, like you know, huge guys. Like, oh, I'm six foot five. I'm going to like bulldoze over like really strong guys. And they, they, they scheduled this call because th I know them in the industry. Right. And so I never do calls with potential clients or anything. We just we get too many salespeople. I just, I don't have time, but I agreed to do it with these guys. Cause I kind of knew them through speaking engagement stuff but I never really talked to them, if that makes sense. They both get on there, they're like, like this on Zoom. And the first thing out of their mouth is like, hey, great to have you on here. We just, you know, we're interested in partnering with a really good uh, sales trainer. And we're just talking to a bunch of sales trainers right now to see, you know, see what they're all about and see if we should go with them. And we just wanna know what you guys do. That's the first thing out of their mouth. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna be like, how about if we do this, we do that? And like, you know, lower status, because that's what the frame they're putting me in. Okay, mm -hmm. so how do I take them out of that frame of like, like, remember I talked about the President Trump frame, like I'm dominating over you, like I'm gonna show you that of higher status, that's what they were doing. That subconsciously, we don't even know we're doing these things. They just subconsciously do it. So how do I interrupt their pattern? So playful tone, you gotta use a playful tone here, otherwise it won't work. I'm like, I don't know guys, we might have to break up. You guys haven't, you guys haven't written me, you haven't sent any text messages, there's no more love letters, I'm not getting any phone calls anymore, we might have to break up over there. And they're like, oh my God, they just started letting guards down. And they didn't even ask the question again. Well, what are you guys looking for? And I went right into it, but I had to get them their guard down first. Mm. But I use a playful tone. If I was like, well, I'm not sure guys, you haven't written me, there hasn't been any love letters, there's no text messages, you haven't even called, I think we should break up. That's not gonna land all, that's kind of weird, yeah. right? But it's the playful tone. Or if they're like, hey, you doing today? Oh, you know, just hanging out, being the boring guy. What about you? Are you being boring over there? Oh no, I'm sure you're not boring. See, it's just, guard mm -hmm. down but i have to use a playful tone if i used a curious tone that wouldn't land see the difference is the tone that's how they interpret your intention behind what you're saying or asking mm -hmm. you know that's probably the most important thing as a salesperson that nobody knows which is really interesting within your courses and the stuff that you're teaching is a lot of it around tonality a lot of it yeah i mean we we have 37 different training courses so our main course is a 51 hour version and you know, probably there's probably good, when we're asking the questions, we're training you what tone to use with the questions. Mm -hmm. It's not just tonality, we're training you like, here's why mm -hmm. you're using a concern tone here. Oh, what's really holding you back from getting started just so I understand, like I'm concerned, right? Rather than like, what's really holding you back from getting started? That's a defensive <laughs> it's tone, like, that Whoa. wouldn't work, <laughs> that wouldn't work, right? Yeah. I'd get them defensive. I said the same thing, I'm gonna trigger defensiveness if I asked it in a challenging tone, compared to if I asked it in a concern tone. Mm. Like I'm concerned for you that your problems are gonna stay the same. Yeah. yeah? So coming the back- The mind rolling around there. See yeah, it's very stuff rolling. going on mm -hmm. in there. Like coming back for your situation, like what is preventing you from being master? Like what, what gaps do you need to fill in your- I, I, I don't think anybody masters communication in this life. That's just my personal opinion. I don't think you can be, uh, nobody's perfect in anything in this life, mm. including communication now. Can I get closer and closer? Yeah, for sure. That's why I'm always learning, but I'm in my forties. I'm not, you know, I, I won't master it till the, till yeah, after. Yeah. Maybe we'll master it in the next life. I don't know, level. we'll see. Besides tonality, are there any other things that you'd say would be equal to or, or close to as equal? Yeah, I mean, this is gonna sound crazy, your facial expressions. Mm. 
Facial because your facial expressions are the remote control to have your voice sounds. Yeah, try having a small and dull tone with a straight face. Wow. Mm. Would you be using facial on the cold call? Because it affects your tone. Yeah, try having a familiar tone without moving your face. It's Jeremy. Jeremy Minor. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, it's Jeremy. J- Jeremy Minor. Even body language as well. Yeah. And hand gestures. Even, well, it's the yeah, same thing, isn't it? The, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. So, when, you know, people always ask me, like, they'll see me in the reels. I always have, like, a pin in my hand or something in my hand. Yeah, I know. That's because my, uh, the person I learned tonality from, acting coach, taught me to use that to verbal pace out my sentences and questions. So it kept... To slow moving. down. Yeah, to slow down. Because it's like in an orchestra. You know, the conductor uh, has this thing up here that controls you're conducting the melody. Yourself. You're controlling the melody, so I'm conducting my brain where to slow down and where to pause. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy stuff. There's a lot of nuances to get higher levels of sales ability for sure, but those are big deals. So, oh, what, what actually happened then? So if I'm on the phone, if I'm like, if I'm just sitting here, oh, what actually happened then? It's harder, like, oh, what, what actually happened? Just yeah. the facial expressions and the tone shift. Mm. Cause it's like, if you're watching, I mean, who's your favorite actor or actress? We watched the movie with Brad Pitt yeah. and George Clooney. Well, watch his facial expressions. Mm. See how his master has certain facial expressions to communicate different tones, communicates different emotions that you feel while you're watching it. So they're taught to, tri- you know, actors and actors, the best are taught to trigger different emotional drivers in the audience. So you stay engaged and keep watching the movie. Mm. Imagine, imagine if, like Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible. You see Mission Impossible? Mm-hmm. If he's like, all right, let's go down to the van because in the van there's a bomb and <laughs> the bomb, like it could blow up. It's not up exciting, is it? Have, it's, there's no tone. It's like monotone. Okay, let's, we have to go down to the van right now because it could blow up. The facial expressions, the tone, the body language keep your brain engaged. Mm. So we teach that to salespeople to keep the prospect engaged. Mm. Certainty. How do I trigger 100% mm. certainty? How do I lose certainty by the prospect not being present? unengaged, you lose certainty. You're going through a long presentation, you're monotone, you lose the prospect's brain. They start mm-hmm. thinking about the, the kids they gotta pick up, they start thinking about the dry cleaning, and then at the end, they're uncertain, hard for them to make a buying decision. How long should people present for, on average? It, it, okay, there's no, there's no straight, I don't wanna give a straight jacket interpretation on that, because it's gonna depend on your industry, and it's gonna depend on what you're talking about. So if I'm presenting, let's say, c- cybersecurity to Bank of America, my presentation is gonna be a little bit longer probably than let's say if I'm a salesperson and I'm selling real estate. You know, saying real estate, or yeah, solar. for sure. Yeah, or solar. It, it depends on the context, yeah. But probably much shorter than everybody does. Yeah. Just put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you think people talk themselves out of the sale by trying to present for too long, not asking the right questions, not having a framework? Because you lose engagement. Correct. Yeah, you lose yeah. engagement and you're all logical. And the brain doesn't buy logically that starts mm-hmm. it they buy emotionally. Yeah. So you lose the emotional side. Even little things like I could say, Do you th- do you think this could be the answer for you? Well think you just took them back to their logical brain. So I'm gonna say, Do you, do you feel, feel do you feel like this could be the feel answer? Aligned? Feel is emotion. I'm keeping them on emotional side. Mm. Mm. See? Little things like that. Or like, oh of course you need to think it over. I didn't give you enough information. Well you just took their brain back to information, research mode, logical thinking. I want to keep them on the right side, the emotional part of the brain. Little nuances like this make or break deals. What's the and shortened sales cycles? You know, when I got into B two B, I'm in debt relief service. Like the average deal size, Jeremy's twelve months, nine to twelve months. I'm like, I'm like, why is it so long? We solved their problems. My average deal size was like two and a half months. Two and a half. Yeah, pushing through legal everything, big deals, because I knew how to trigger urgency where they're like. They had so much internal tension that like they had to solve it. So they would literally push everything through legal in the contract just to get it done because the pain felt so bad because I helped them relive their pain, have a fear of future pain. If you don't know how to do that, that's why they keep pushing it out, procrastinating, missing some meetings, meeting with some other vendors. That's because you don't want to sell. That's what causes sales cycles to extend because they don't want to build urgency to change and change now. Yeah. That's really good. There My last go. question for yeah, you. What's, up, dude? <laughs> what's been the best sentence or ty- or nuance you've you've learnt that you could share? The N- best yeah. sentence? The best sales sentence or nuance you've or question. Ever- you wanna know a really funny one? I do. So when a prospect starts um, when a prospect starts like negotiating with you and stuff like that and like and they're not so serious but they're like kinda negotiating you with stuff, I'd be like, Whoa, 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 you're putting a lot of sales pressure on me here. What's going on? <laughs> 
they just laugh. It's just a disarming technique. That's just funny. That just came to my mind. I have a, I have a lot of little things like That's that. Good. I don't know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're putting a lot of sales pressure on me, Joanna. Gee, many Christmas. You're making me sell this house in like two or three weeks. Like, I'm not Batman. What's going on? Mm. It's just a little being playful. But you got a playful tone there. Mm. If I'm like, whoa, 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 you're putting a lot of sales pressure on me here, mm. Joanna. Doesn't work. They're like, weirdo. Sounds awkward, mm. you know? So it's, it's the tone, the body language, the type of things. And the questions you ask, you know, it's a big deal. The questions, like, if you're like, well, why do you want to sell the property? It's completely different than, like, I mean, the home you have now, I mean, this is a really nice home. What's caused you to feel like mm. you might want to sell it? What's caused you to And now they're defending themselves on why they want to sell it rather than say, why do you want to sell it? They're like, oh, I don't know. I just want to make more money. Hold on. I mean, the house you have now, I mean, it's a fairly decent property here. I mean, what's caused you to feel like, feel like, feel like, you might want to sell it. Notice a verbal pause. Mm -hmm. Feel like you might want, might, so neutral, want to sell it. What's caused you to feel like you might want to sell it? See, I'm reframing the question where I'm interrupting their pattern. They don't know that type of question. They've never been asked that type of question because I'm getting them to defend themselves on why they want to change mm. rather than me trying to get them to you know, tell them rather than me trying to like get it out of them, I'm getting them to defend themselves on why they need to change now. Mm -hmm. So I'm always building urgency with the questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Building urgency. Yeah. Yeah. Sublimely just building urgency. Yeah. That was awesome. stuff like that. There that you was go. Phenomenal. That was right. Maddie, like price anchoring. You haven't even talked about price anchoring with real estate price? agents. Let's Cause do you it. guys, real estate agents, I just think it's funny. Like they're like, Oh, you know, the, the buyer's like, Oh, I think, what do you want to sell it for? Oh, 5 million. You're like, there's no, in your mind, like there's no way it's going to sell for this. But if you say, I think it's only worth 4.3, they're going to get pissed and go with the other agent that says they could really sell for five. And then it sits there for eight months and doesn't sell, and then they fire the agent. So I'm like, you guys don't know how to price anchor this stuff. How do you we do that? Anchor? Oh, wouldn't you want to know? No, so I might say something like, ah, oh, I'd have to look at our real estate scripts. I'm probably going to get it wrong. But I might say, and this is towards the end of the conversation. I built a big gap. They feel tension. They want to sell. Like, now, what, what are you hoping to sell the property for? What are you hoping to get out of the property? Okay. Run the way you want to sell it for like, Oh, I'm hoping to get, cause usually they'll go down a little bit. Uh, what are you hoping you could get out of the property? Oh, if I could get 6 million of the property. Okay. 6 million. You have to look at the comps. Now, can I, can I suggest something with that? Can I, can I say something that you getting angry at me? Oh, of course we're not getting angry. See, I'm disarming them. I'm prepping them. Okay. And I say, so what happens if, uh, if we start bringing, you know, we're going to bring these, you know, buyers around and we're going to show them. And what happens if they're, I guess you'd call them seller agents or the buyer, agents. Buyer, buyers, because you always mixed up with us and you guys, what happens with their buyer agents if they start looking at comms around the home uh, around the area and they find that there's homes, you know, somewhat similar to ours. I mean, yours is definitely the nicest, but somewhat similar, but those homes are selling for 10 or 15% less. And then that causes the home to set here a little bit longer. I mean, what should we do at that point? <laughs> well, at the, it's probably better than that. I'm probably not remembering. Well, at that point, and they'll start coming down. Like, well, at that point, we really need like 4.5. Okay, so <laughs> 4.5 could be a possibility. So I'm, I'm prepping them yeah. that if it doesn't sell for that, that we already have a plan to lower it without saying, well, what if it, without being too direct. And so they don't the get mad at you, you if it doesn't sell. And a lot of times you can go down lower and it causes an, it's price anchoring. Yeah. It's good. Anchoring. It's a good yeah. question. I, I probably have, I'd look up the scripts, probably said better than that in their scripts, but that just came off the top of my head. That was really good. Yeah. Well, there you go. But it's all in the tone because mm -hmm. now I'm acting concerned. Remember the concern mm -hmm. tone there at the end? Mm -hmm. I mean, what should, and let's say that it sets there because a lot of the homes that are in, in there are, you know, somewhat, sim I say somewhat, I don't say similar because they'll be like, no, our home's the best. Somewhat similar to yours, but they're selling for 10 or 15% less. And let's say it causes the home to stay here for four, six, eight months. I mean, what would we do at that point? See that concerned tone. See, I'm building trust, showing empathy. It's hard for them to say, well, I'm just going to fire you. Or like, they're not going to say that because you've already built a big gap. And mm. You can't ask that question the very first question because mm. it wouldn't work. I'm doing that towards the end of the conversation. I've already built a gap. They're emotionally involved. They felt pain. They're, they, they're like, have a fear of future pain if it doesn't sell. And emotionally, they're connected. So they'll just, you know, shift them down to sell it at a lower rate. Well, we can, let's see, let's see, eh, maybe four, six, four, seven. Let's see what happens. Are you guys okay with that? You're not going to get angry at me if I sell it quicker for a little bit less so it doesn't set here? I mean, it just depends on the context. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I like it. Yeah. Same things like that. Do you have any last questions, Hannah? No, I'm good. good. I'm just going to flick over to Matty Sharma, who's our guest. Last question. Matt, what's your last question? Thanks, Jeremy. That was awesome, man. Oh, thanks. Just a, it's a cheeky 
two question in one firstly when you're building seventh level like your business and i think it might add value to the three of us two building our businesses performance if there are 10 out of 10 killer in sales versus there may be a two out of 10 culture fit mm. or a 10 out of 10 culture fit but really like not the best sales person yeah what Depend sort of people would you have in that? It depends on how big you want your organization to be. Because if you're in a big organization, you're going to have to learn how to deal with any of those. Mm. You're never going to be able to have like culture fit. It's just you ha you're going to have to deal with drama queens. You're going to have to deal with the whole thing. Whole thing, good, bad, ugly to build a big organization. If you want to keep it small, you know, where would I go? I mean, realistically for me, I mean, I'd have to see the context of the person that's a 10 out of 10 sales compared to two culture wise. Like, what does that mean culture wise? Are they like doing drugs in the bathroom? Are they doing crazy stuff? Are they just, I don't know what that means, but I'd probably pick the person that's a 10 out of 10 salesperson over the guy that can't, guy or gal that can't sell because you're not going to build anything with nobody that can't sell. Love it. It's all about and production, then, isn't it? <laughs> it's about production. And then the I got to learn how to manage their personality. Uh, yeah. I got to learn how to manage their personality and can I train them how to be a better mm. culture fit? Can I take them out of that way of thinking? and help them into a new way of thinking to train them to become a leader. See, in my mind, that's what I'd want to do rather than just like, you're not a good culture fit, you're out. I would want to be able to help them overcome that way of thinking that mm. keeps them there and reframe them to a new way of thinking to be a leader. Mm. And that was the last little bit on how does that converse, all your sales techniques, how do you use that with saying a, a, a talent in your team? Like spoken a lot on like do, prospects. I, you know, I wish I could say I don't do any of the hiring. So I don't, I don't do any hiring. We have the vice president of sales and recruiting that's over the recruitment and hiring of our sales and all, all that people. And then we have other department heads that hire the, you know, the, the vice president of operations, the vice president of marketing, and they're the ones that do all the hiring and firing in those different departments. Now, sometimes I might step in. I'm like, no, nah, we got we to gotta keep this person. Like you're, just because you guys don't get along, like they're performing, we're going to keep them. But for the most part, they make those decisions themselves. Love it. Yeah. Unreal. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, awesome. and if they want to, do they, if they want to learn anything yeah. about us? Yeah. So if they want to, if they want to learn a good place to start here, we'll put a link here, go get our NEPQ black book of questions. It's a 150 page manual, 115 page manual. It's like 20 bucks or something. They can get that. Now books are not going to like quadruple your sales. I can assure you of that because books are just words. How are you going to master tonality from a book? You're not. You can't, can't learn body language and you know, words, uh, when you read a book, how many books do you have memorized? Do you have one page of any book memorized? Do you have one song memorized? Maybe one. Yeah, for sure. Everybody has a song they can sing. If I'm like, hey, <laughs> sing that song, your partner will be like, oh, I sing that all day, right? Do you know why she can memorize every, every on average, on average, I'll end with this. On average, every song has about 300, 350 words. Mm -hmm. Each page of most books have about the same amount of words. So why can you remember the words in a song, mm. yet you can't remember the words in a book? because of the melody and the tone causes your brain to retain it far more than That's reading good. words in a book. You read a book, you retain less than 3% within 30 days. Wow. There you go. So books are an overview. They're like an introduction to changing sales, but they're not gonna like quadruple your sales. You need to get into uh, training courses, video courses, see the tone, body language, you need to get group coaching, uh, individual coaching. That's where you get to a higher level in okay. sales for sure. So they can go get this book, We'll put a link in here. They can always go to like Amazon or barnesandnoble.com. These are Wall Street Journal bestseller, uh, Barnes & Noble bestseller called The New Model of Selling, Selling to an Unsellable Generation. If they need uh, funds to buy the $17 book, we can always start like a GoFundMe account for them. I'm just joking. <laughs> Where can but they, they can start there. Those are good places to start. They want more advanced training. They can reach out to our team. Yeah, I was going to say that. Where is a couple, if you're already doing one, two million dollars in commission, where would they go to? I mean, most people are just, you know, they might read a book, but they're going to get into other courses, right? So we, we train probably some of the top real estate agents in the United States, North America now, supposedly from what we've heard. Uh, they'd be more in our NEPQ 3.0 program, our advanced inner circle, which is industry specific. So that's where we train you like little nuances that I was showing you just off the top of my head, which I probably messed some of those up. But that program is industry specific to every industry. And real estate agents is the second largest industry in the world we train. So it's a big space for us. Big one in that program. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thanks for having Thanks us on. Thanks for having us. <laughs>